Welcome. I'm Eric Fleming, host of A Moment with Eric Fleming, the podcast of our time. I want to personally thank you for listening to the podcast. If you like what you're hearing, then I need you to do a few things. First, I need subscribers. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash a moment with Eric Fleming. Your subscription allows an independent podcaster like me the freedom to speak truth to power and to expand and improve the show. Second, leave a five-star review for the podcast on the streaming service you listen to it. That will help the podcast tremendously. Third, go to the website, momenteric.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast, leave reviews and comments, listen to past episodes, and even learn a little bit about your host. Lastly, don't keep this a secret like it's your own personal guilty pleasure. Tell someone else about the podcast. Encourage others to listen to the podcast and share the podcast on your social media platforms because it is time to make this moment a movement. Thanks in advance for supporting the podcast of our time. I hope you enjoy this episode as well. Fleming. I am your host, Eric Fleming. And so this episode, as we're coming up on the 4th of July, uh, I wanted to have somebody on to try to inspire people. And uh, the guest that I have uh, is more than capable of doing that. And so I'm really honored to have her coming on. Um, and also, um, I had the privilege of attending an event that's kind of becoming a thing uh, in, in the black community. And so I'm going to give my take on that. And, um, you know, and it's, it's, it was it was an interesting experience, to say the least. Uh, so before we get, first of all, thank y'all for listening again. Thank y'all for tuning in to the podcast and uh, keep doing that. Um, I still got the GoFundMe thing going, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the closing. Uh, but before we get into any of all any of that. I was about to say any of all that before we get into any more of this discussion uh, it's time for a moment of news with Grace G thanks Eric President Biden and Donald Trump engaged in a spirited presidential debate hosted by CNN in Atlanta Julian Assange pled guilty to violating U.S. espionage law and was allowed to return to Australia. Representative Jamal Bowman lost the Democratic primary in New York's 16th Congressional District, while Representative Lauren Boebert won the Republican primary in Colorado's 4th Congressional District. A New York judge partially lifted a gag order on Donald Trump, allowing him to speak publicly about witnesses and the jury, but maintaining restrictions on comments about prosecutors in his criminal case. Manhattan prosecutors dropped criminal charges against pro-Palestinian student protesters who occupied a Columbia University building in April. The Biden administration will bypass a Republican hold to award nearly $110 million in security assistance to Haiti. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld a federal law criminalizing gun possession by individuals under domestic violence restraining orders. The U.S. Surgeon General declared gun violence a public health crisis, urging actions to prevent rising firearm-related deaths and their effects. A shooter opened fire at an Arkansas supermarket, killing three and wounding ten, including two police officers before being wounded in a shootout with police. The Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled that the state's approval of a publicly funded religious charter school is unconstitutional. 
Federal judges in Kansas and Missouri partially blocked Biden's student debt relief initiative, set to take effect on July 1st. Steve Bannon petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to delay his prison sentence for contempt of Congress while he appeals his conviction. And Democrats will allow social media influencers to cover their national convention. I am Grace G, and this has been a moment of news. All right, thank you, Grace, for that moment of news. And now it is time for my guest. And her name is Deetra Giles. Regarded as the CEO maker, DEI professor, and the cubicle to corner office empress, Deetra Giles is a workplace and career optimizer who advises organizations and individuals and how to chart their unique paths to success. She is a four-time TEDx speaker who has been named a top 100 HR influencer by Engagedly and was selected by HR Gazette's HR Chat podcast as one of the top 22 most influential figures in HR with clients including including Kaiser Permanente, the Centers for Disease Control, better known as the CDC, the Army Corps of Engineers, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, the National Basketball Association, and the Salvation Army. Giles shares a unique blend of advanced education and industry experience that has been described as university-tested and industry-approved and can be implemented by organizations of any size and across industries. Since 2007, Giles has served as the CEO at ExecuPrep, an international performance optimization firm that works with groups and individuals all over the world to improve performance, productivity, and profit. In her role, she leads a team of, in her words, dope professionals, who are on a mission to make businesses better from the top down and bottom up. At the same time, Giles is the host of the Happily Ever Employed podcast and appears every week on the nationally syndicated radio program, The Willie Moore Jr. Show, where she shares her insights on how to navigate professional and personal success. Previously, she has served as adjunct faculty at the Federal Executive Institute, Georgia State University, Mercer University, and as a faculty member for Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses and the Tory Burch Foundation. From coaching multi-billion dollar organizations to speaking at some of the largest global conferences, Giles' strategies for success have had a lasting impact on the people and audiences all over the world. The wisdom she shares sparks a change in behavior that ultimately leads to change in all aspects of work and life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Deetra Giles. All right, Deetra Giles, how you doing, sister? You doing good? I am doing great. And just a quick correction: it is Giles. Giles would kill me if you say Giles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and in my in my brain, I had been saying Giles the whole time, and I was so focused on making sure I got the Detra right because on the website you explain how to say the name. So, as long exactly. as I got, the, so I appreciate the correction always. Um, how you doing, sister? You doing good? I am well. Just got back from Chicago at a major conference, so a little bit tired, but I'm well. Well, that's where I'm from. That's my old stomping grounds. I grew up in Chicago uh, and then came down to the South in 1983 and spent about 30 plus years in Mississippi, and now I'm in Atlanta. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, Yeah, I can complain. Yeah, and this time of year is the best time to go to Chicago by the way. Oh, this is the only time to go to Chicago. I tell people. 
no one does summer better than the shy. But winter, I was like, the summer has to be great because that's how you convince people to stay here. Because exactly. winters, oh my gosh. Uh-uh. Yeah, it's mm-mm. terrible. No, only time to go is winter. And even spring, y'all mess up spring. Because spring can be 90 or it could be below zero. I, I, well, it's it's because we're a big baseball town. Since we got two teams, you know, the weather kind of fluctuates. If the team is sucks, then the weather's bad and they don't play many games. Uh, <laughs> if, they, if they start off good, it's like, what is 90 degrees in May? What are we doing? You know, yeah. <laughs> That's just kind of it. All right, look, um, normally when I start off my interviews, I throw a quote at the guest. So your quote is, don't let your gift take you where your character can't keep you. What does that quote mean to you? Actually, it's a quote that I heard from a pastor one time. And and it's interesting enough, it was Pastor Freddie Haynes. um, And he said that quote one years ago at a revival and it stuck out in my head it was like someone stood up in the room and said Dietra remember this quote you will need it and it stands out to me so much because I get the luxury of coaching high level people I mean I'm coaching C-suite CEOs chief operating officers you know people that have that chief title of some of the largest companies in the world, not the U.S., in the world. And I am coaching them through how to be a better leader, how to improve performance, productivity, profits for their company. I am coaching them how to be responsible for the hundreds and thousands of lives that depend on them doing their job well. And one of the things I realize as I'm coaching some of these people is they are amazingly talented. They are amazingly gifted. They are brilliant. And their character is horrible. And we people often wonder, how did somebody get to this point in their career and they mess up, embezzle hundreds of millions of dollars? How can an Enron happen? How can this type of thing happen? It's because there were people that had levels of gifting that their character could not handle. And so my job is to make sure that the people that I'm coaching, the people that are responsible for lives, that their character actually matches their talent. Yeah, and that's, uh, uh, that quote means a lot for somebody like me that's been in politics um, and, you know, the current dynamics that, that are going on. So, you know, when I, when I, when I came across that, I said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that quote out there as a quote that she responds to. Because it's, it's very, very true. So, <clears throat> excuse me. If I described you as a purveyor of manifestations, how would you take that? Oh, my gosh. I, I would take it as an honor because that's, that's really how I think. I, I really, when I talk to my clients and even when I'm working either as a coach or as a consultant for a company, I really tell them, you probably see my my uh, social media, and I call myself the chief bridge architect. And people often ask, are you an architect? And I was like, well, kind of, but not by training. And I say that because I tell my tagline is I help you build and cross the bridge from I want to be to I am. My job is to get people to the other side, that chasm that they can't figure out. They're on this side and they can see the thing. They can imagine the thing. They can feel the thing mentally, but they just can't wrap their minds around how to manifest that thing they want to be, how to actually get there. What does it look like to get from here to there? And that's what I do. So when you say that, I'm like, yeah, that might be my new tagline. (laughs) Well, you know. I uh, just drop me a, a couple of pennies if you, <laughs> if you do that. Don't. Um, so in your journey from Miami to now, when did you uncover and understand the belief systems that was holding you back? You know what? It took a while. And if I'm very honest, it's still being uncovered. So, so much of our childhood, we just absorb as normalities, so much so that we don't recognize that those are limiting beliefs, that those are obstacles, that those are barriers to the thing we say we want to do. 
And I think we spend the rest of our lives figuring that out. Oftentimes it's revealed by a certain instance or something that that happened. For example, yesterday I just got back from Chicago and I had a driver pick me up, sent me a message saying, hey, you know, your driver's here. When you get there, um, let me know. And still, I've been doing this for a while and I still... Every time the driver picks me up, I still have to remind myself that I'm getting in their way by trying to get my own bags, by getting my own door, because that wasn't how I was raised, right? Coming from not having money, I would see people helping, and my I was the one helping. My family was the one helping. So all I thought was, how do I be of help? Because this is a burden for someone to have to do this for you. And stepping back and saying, you know what? It's not a burden. You, they are freeing you up to do what you need to be doing and they have a job to do, get out of their way and allow them to do it. And so some of that is the unthinking that I have to do in my own head for myself. And that's revealed every single day. Every day I have to ask myself, are you allowing the little girl that didn't have get in the way of the grown woman that needs to do things and people are here to help them do that? You once said that a good idea at the wrong time is a bad idea and that you were okay not knowing. I think we have a lot of people in politics that don't practice that. Why are those concepts important in leadership and relationship building? Oh my gosh. So let's talk about in politics for a second. One of the things I'm very passionate about, if you all have followed me and you probably know this, I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And one of our five point thrusts is around political activism and getting people involved. And one of the things I often, often, often pushing about is I hate the way we do our political activism, not Delta in general, but in the our U.S. in general. Political activism only happens about every four years on the masses. Those of us who are active politically, we're active all 24 seven because we're like your local election matters way more than this once every four year election. Right. Um, But on the masses, it happens every four years. And because of that, I think we push a lot of our politicians to not have the right ideas at the right time to talk about what can get them reelected. When we know the thing that really matters is not that thing. And so when we talk about the right idea at the wrong time, we see it happen quite often. We see people start to focus on things that don't really matter to the common person, to the everyday person. They matter to getting reelected because it's that hot button emotional item that people will rally around. But at the end of the day, does that change the fact that bread now costs one hundred and fifty five dollars? (laughs) You know, does it change the fact that your school systems are still failing? Does it change the fact that you have to change your tires every other month because the potholes in your in your on your streets are so deep? No, it doesn't. And so oftentimes we're consistently talking about the wrong ideas at the wrong time and they feel right for getting reelected, but they're wrong for our everyday American. Yeah. And and, you know. I got criticized a lot because my legislative strategy was introduce as many bills as I could, right? I would introduce like 150 bills a session. And, you know, and and people that are lobbying, you know, like certain activist groups, they say, well, we don't get it. Then we just have to regroup a year and blah, you know, and, you know, think about when and how to do and all that. And I said, look, You'll never know how a legislative session goes until you get there. And if you Mm -hmm. decide not to push for an issue that you pushed for last year because you weren't successful, you might miss out on your opportunity this session. So, you know, and so there were bills that I would introduce for like three, four or five years. And that fifth year, for example, all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, we're pushing this through the committee. Eric, can you come down and talk about this? Blah, blah, this, that, other. So you never Absolutely. know, but you've got to always be out there. And like you said, it's not about getting elected. It's about the next generation. It's about pushing 
ideas that are going to benefit people down the road. And if, and if it's a good idea, you know, then you wait for your time, you know, but you yeah. don't, you don't necessarily wait on the sidelines and just say, Ooh, this might be it. No, you gotta, you gotta keep pushing it and you gotta educate people to get the mindset to that point. But anyway, Absolutely. go ahead. I, I tell people, I tell people quite often that, I wish I if a politician stands up and says, I am running and my my I am not here for reelection. I will not run again after this. They will probably have me backing them because we have too many politicians who are not working for the people they are working to be reelected. And if you're working for re-election, then you are not committed to doing what needs to be done. You're committed to being re-elected. And those are often two very different things. I remember it was a, um, oh my gosh, I love this per- this person. I can't think of his name right now, but he is a was a prime minister over in France. And he said, the problem is not that we don't know what to do. The problem is that we don't know how to get re-elected after we do it. And that is a quote that has always stayed with me because it was so true about how politicians are. We look at them and we're sitting there like, you know, good and well, this is not what needs to be done. Those of us who are truly politically active and are not concerned about these hot topics that are concerned about the actual people that we're impacting, those of us at the local level who are like, no, 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 I care who my magistrate judge is. I care who my county sheriff is. I care who's on the school board. I care who's on the board of my local hospital. I'm sitting there like, who are we putting on the board of the hospital? Because I need to make sure I'm going to get the quality of care. And that's what matters. I'm the person that has really gone to the sheriff's office and said, you only won by 300 votes. I know 400 people. So here's what we need in this community, right? And so it's that. It's getting people to recognize I'm not here to be reelected. I'm here to serve the people. And that's the piece that will make the shift when we talk about our political environment. Right. And then the other key point of that question, you know, it's OK to say, I don't know. You mm-hmm. know, I think a lot of people get hung up is that, well, I've got to come across as I'm this expert and blah, blah, this, that and the other, you know, but you're going to get a crazy question like. When I was running for the U.S. Senate, this young man asked me, what are you going to do about China stealing oil from the Gulf of Mexico and giving it to Cuba, right? And my best answer was, I promise you, if I'm a U.S. Senator, that's not going to happen. And it was easy for me to say that because it's not happening. But the reality is, if that really, <laughs> the, the reality is, is that if it was really happening, the, my question would be, yeah, I don't I don't really know right now, but once I get in and find out, you know, how everything is going and what we can and can't do, you know, then I'll be able to answer that. And that doesn't to me, that's a sign of wisdom when you don't know what you don't know, right? Oh my God. Or if you know what you don't know. And and if I don't know. What what do you think about that real quick? I think I th- I think not knowing is the most beautiful thing and the most beautiful place to be. People that know or think they know cannot learn, right? And so we have a bunch of people who are not open to admitting that they need to learn, which means they didn't go there to learn. What we what we really need, I was actually speaking at, when I was in Chicago, one of the sessions I did was called um, followership. Um, and I talked about what prevents followership from being sexy in organizations is that we say we have a learning environment, but we have a knowing environment. And knowing environments versus learning environments are totally different. Learning environments embrace people saying, I don't know. But if I don't know, it's now my responsibility to figure it out, to learn, to use all of my resources to become knowledgeable. If we have a knowing environment, saying I don't know is a, it's, it's a mark against you. It's now this bad thing. Oh, my gosh, you're ignorant. You don't know. And that's often what people are facing in this political environment. We ask them dumb, uninformed questions like this. Because when you said that, I was like, that, that, that's not happening. Right. And so people get to ask crazy questions. 
and we acquiesce to them. And and what we have is an environment of people who really don't know. There were people in that room that were like, yeah, that's a good question. What you going to do? And they aren't even in, 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 informed enough to say, well, that's not actually happening. And they will feed into that. And now that's a whole new narrative on social media. Did you all know China is stealing oil and giving it to Cuba? And now that becomes the latest story, right? And and that's the world we live in. So we have to get to this, this place where it's okay to know. One of my favorite things I say, and people laugh at me, because they're, they're like, so how can you be egotistical and self-deprecating in the same sentence? And I'm like, easily. Because I tell people I am the best in the world at what I do. No one better me, than me. The best in the world. But what I don't do, I'm the most incompetent. And I'm very comfortable in both of those. Right? What that does is it allows me to do what I do best and serve the people I serve well. But it also frees me up to say, you know what? In this area, I need to follow someone else's leadership and client I am not the best to serve you here. Let's find somebody who is so you can have the best outcome because I'm going to get my clients the best outcome no matter what. Yeah, I, I saw in the interview that you said that when somebody asked you who's the weakest link in the room and you said, if I'm in the room, me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you have this attitude that it's like, I know a lot of stuff. I'm good at what I do but I'm not great at everything. And so mm -hmm. I can always learn something from somebody else. And a lot of times, especially in politics, humility. So what I tell people all the time is that ego is an important part of running for office to have the mm -hmm. concept in your mind that I can go talk to uh, Miss Giles and, and the Deltas and I can go to other groups and convince them to vote for me in an election. You have to have an ego to do that. You have to have some confidence in order to do that. What the trap is, is that if you are successful and you get in, then if you don't have your ego in check, then you become arrogant. And then you, be, then, then you start crossing lines that you can't come back from. So, you know, it's like when a politician says, I don't have an ego, it's like, then you shouldn't be running for office. What's your thought mm -hmm. about that? <laughs> so I often, I, I like to separate, and the, the two can be synonymous depending on how you are. I like to separate ego and confidence, right? Okay. Um, and the reason I do that is not because of the, 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 the dictionary definition, if you will. It's because of the connotation, what people think when they hear the words, right? When people hear ego, they think egotistical, prideful, power, um, wanting to be, oftentimes when they think of ego, they think of power over someone else. This idea of superiority versus inferiority. That's the connotation. That's the, that's what comes to mind when we think of this, this word. But confidence is associated with, for me, confidence is associated with data, right? When I say... I'm one of the best in the world at what I do. The data, especially, let's say when I'm talking different things, consulting, speaking, but let's say speaking. When I speak at a conference, I come back and they will consistently in my over 15 years of being a keynote speaker, consistently come back and say, Deetra, you have been our highest rated speaker ever. I spoke at a conference and they said that this conference has been going on for 30 years. Conference had been going on for 30 years. And I came back as their highest rated speaker in 30 years, right? So when I say I'm the best in the world at this, there is data. And the world is, of course, figurative. But I have data to support that I am a really good speaker. It sounds egotistical, but that's confidence. I'm not saying you're bad. You shouldn't be higher. You're horrible. You can't speak. I'm just saying I'm really good and I have the data to support that. Right. When I think of ego, it's different. And it's saying you are not even in the weight class with me. I'm better than you. I'm not better than you. We, it's room for all of us to be amazing. Right. And so when I think of ego versus confidence, I think of confidence as I have the data to support what I'm saying. So confidence says, I can go talk to these groups because I have something to offer them. But confidence also says, I want this to be symbiotic. 
Ego says, I have something for you. Shut up, listen, and I'm leaving. Confidence says, I have something for you, and it's going to be really amazing, but I also want to hear what you have for me. I feel you on that. I, um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, I always have to negotiate the connotation, but that's why I challenge it the way I do as far as saying mm -hmm. ego, because you have to have some pride in yourself to step out there. Cause you talk about, you talk about being an introvert. I'm an introvert. My dad is always, was always amazed because I grew up an only child. And he said, I never, I knew you were interested in politics, but I never thought you would be the candidate because one, you, you're allergic to BS. And then two, you're not really, you're an introvert. And so it was just kind of like to watch you shaking hands and giving speeches and all that stuff. I was like, wow, that's my child. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you, you, you teach that you explain to people about how being an int how you can come across as being an extrovert and truly be an introvert. So that's, that's the reason why I, 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 I couch it the way that I say it. And mm -hmm. that's just from my, my personal experience. Yeah. And, and it's true. I think people are shocked at, I have people that will argue me down, even psychologists. <laughs> when I say, I have a preference for introversion. I've had actual PhD practicing psychologists say, no, you're not. First of all, how are you going to tell me what I am? <laughs> Number two, I have taken the same test you took and I'm certified in them as well. And number three, I know people often have a misunderstanding of what those two dichotomies on the Myers-Briggs is MBTI, the Myers-Briggs exam or test is about, right? Myers-Briggs type indicator, when you talk about, it's about a preference. Where do you, and, and introversion versus extroversion, people often think it's about people. How much do you like people or being around people? And it's really not, it's about where do you get your energy? And like you, I was raised as an only child, but unlike most only children, I was the one that was like, no, I don't want any other siblings. I I, I wasn't that one was like, oh, I wish I had siblings. I did not ever and still don't. I'm very comfortable <laughs> having been raised an only child. Um, but I love people. I love being around people. I love impacting people. All of that. But when I need to get my energy, when I need to think, when I need to revive myself and clear my head, I want to be by myself. I am that person. And it's funny to me because I travel so much and I see people looking at me at dinner sometimes and they have this look of, oh, I feel so sorry for her. She has to eat by herself. And I'm looking at them like, you have no clue. I am here by myself. One, because I love my own company. And two, you have no idea how many people I'm connected with. I never have to eat alone for the rest of my life if I didn't want to. I am here alone because I choose to be and I enjoy it. And so when people, when I tell people I'm introverted, they're like, no, you don't have a preference for introversion. And I'm like, you wait. I have been with, around y'all all day. I cannot wait to get away from all these people <laughs> and get something to, <laughs> to myself. And I'm here. And mind you, it, it throws them off because I am having a good time. I'm not faking it. I am thoroughly enjoying myself. I am thoroughly enjoying meeting people. I am thoroughly enjoying people coming up and telling me, oh, that was such a great session. I learned so much. I want to do X, Y, Z when I get back. I do enjoy that. But I also enjoy it. I can leave y'all. Yeah, and and I know you've got a strong support system, and I and in the time we have, I'm gonna get that question in that addresses that. But I want to, I want to ask you this: so, black women in corporate America face several challenges: pay inequity, microaggressions, imposter syndrome, misogyny, sexual harassment. How do you help black women, especially executives, navigate this environment? And I'll I'll combine it with this. How how does the political climate in America make that harder for you to do the work that you do? Oh, you just asked a whole dissertation. In like <laughs> <questions>. <laughs> I'm like, there are people doing a dissertation work on just one of those. Um, are you asking to address that in a, in a question? 
you know what? It's it's complex. Most of the people that I'm coaching, especially, and not just especially black women, most of the people that I'm coaching are, like I said, senior level executives all the way up to the C-suite. And we're coaching, my coaching is a minimum of six months. So when people come and say, Deetra, I want to be coached by you, my minimum is six months because we don't even really start tapping into the work they truly need to do until about month three. And so when you ask that question, I'm telling you, I have clients that I've coached for years and we're still having to learn to navigate all of that, right? And so it's not a, this is how you do it answer, but I will say, I want to pull out one in particular and I want to talk about imposter syndrome. One of the things I tell everyone, and I do talks about this, I go into companies and help them navigate this with so many of their audiences When we talk about imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome has two parts, and one part is more critical than the other. The thing that impacts particularly Black women when we talk about imposter syndrome is we think we're underestimating ourselves. And people will say, oh my gosh, you have imposter syndrome because you're great and you don't believe you're great. I think that's a misnomer, and it does a detriment to us. The misnomer is we're underestimating ourselves. And that's not true. I really think most of us see ourselves rightly. What we're doing, though, is we're overestimating who they are. We're overestimating how intelligent they are. We're overestimating how much they know. We're overestimating them. And so if we get that right, we will stop trying to improve ourselves and realize I'm on par with where you are. Neither of us know. I've been in those rooms. I've been in the executive suite. I've been an executive myself. I've been the person that hired them. I've been in the strategy room and they aren't that bright. They really aren't that bright. And so I'm saying, no, they're like, Deetra, I don't know how to do this. I don't know the answers to this. They're going to get in the room and ask about this strategy. And the answer is, I don't know. And often I pause them and say, but what if I told you they don't know either? And they're like, of course they know. No, they don't. I'm in that room. I'm coaching you because I sit in that room and I coach that whole group and they don't know. You know why you're having the meeting? Because everyone in there, everyone's there. Nobody knows what we're hoping is collectively with all of the intelligence around this table as a C-suite, as a leadership team, that you have the information and the intelligence to help them figure it out because that's what we're all doing. The second part of that is we often call it imposter syndrome and we put it on the onus of the person. And this is the problem that I think is huge that bothers me. It bothers me. I'm trying to figure out. Sorry. Um, I'm, we, it bothers me because what we've done in these scenarios is we've created imposters and we put it on the person to figure it out when the problem is really the organization. The organization has not given them access to information. The organization has not given them access to influence. The organization hasn't done its part to prepare them for the position they're putting them in. And when they get there and recognize, you know what? I don't feel like I've been properly prepared for this and I need some resources. The organization says, "Ah, ah, ah, you're prepared, go ahead, you're fine. And when they go forward and fail, They feel like they're an imposter when the reality is the organization created an imposter and put the onus on that on them when it shouldn't belong to the person. It should belong to the organization. And so we have to be very mindful that we don't allow that to happen. The last part is we talk about black women navigating in this current environment. And we all know there's an attack on diversity, equity and inclusion Um, There's backlash from when it was sexy and when everybody was all on the bandwagon of, yes, let's put our black box up on social media and say that we're aligned. And here's the truth. Those of us who have been in DEI for a very long time, like myself, my original DEI certification has a floppy disk in the back of it. That's how long I've been in the game. (laughs) We knew, right, we knew that this was going to happen. We sat around and watched and said, we'll wait. We'll wait till you all come back to the real professionals that know this from a strategic perspective. 
And so all the Johnny come lately jumped in because it was sexy and companies were spending money on it. And these companies, they purposefully navigated away from those of us who have been in the field for decades, because what they knew is we would hold them accountable for more than just having a celebration of somebody's month and a potluck dinner and one person come and do unconscious bias training. They knew that what we've been talking about for decades is how do we change the systems within your company so that we have outcomes that are not based on a decision, but they are based on processes that are equitable. They did not want to do that work. So now we're trying to help people navigate this space of, wait, are you a affirmative action hire because a black person or a black woman got this, this position, a black woman was selected, and now they have to navigate the learning of this new environment and also the navigation of, hey, am I being looked at this way? Now I have to prove myself even more. Yeah. Um, I mean, amen to that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> amen to that. Um, so let me get back to the support because I saw you on an interview and, you know, you were talking about your husband and, and, and your family. So the way I'm going to ask the question is what can black men do to be more supportive of the struggles black women face? Um, oh, that's a loaded question. Oh my gosh. It's a loaded question. <laughs> you know what? I think we collectively, one, us as a people, we have to step out of the narratives that are given to us to divide us, right? One of the things I posted one time is I remember when the NFL draft was going on, they had all these pictures posted of the Black NFL recruits that were um, involved with white women. And they put it up as like this was the overarching narrative. And I immediately, and I could see people underneath, uh, Black people, Black men, Black women, they're all commenting on this and that and other. And it was Black men saying, well, y'all Black women need to get it together. That's why we're going over to white women. And Black women saying, y'all don't like us. And I stopped and, and I interjected, and I very rarely interject on social media and crazy stuff like this. But I put in, you all do realize that over, over 80% of partner Black men are partnered with Black women. And of that 20% that aren't partnered with Black women, in that 20%, because you know they're, they're changing what qualifies as what these days. And so when I grew up back in my day, if you were biracial and the other bi was Black, you were Black. Right. So now they're changing that. So in that 20%, the 20% that aren't partnered with Black women are people who are partner with biracial people and one of those races of the biracial person being black, right? So an overarching, an overwhelming number of black men are partnered with black women, which says black men do love black women. Here's the thing. I work with professional sports. And what I also know is that an overarching number of those people, professional athletes, black professional athletes, an overarching number are also partnered with black women. But we're fed this narrative that we don't like each other. We don't love each other. We aren't supporting each other. And the first thing we have to do collectively, both of us, black men and black women, is take ourselves out of the lie because there is we have to ask ourselves who benefits from this lie, who benefits from us believing this. And until we step out of the matrix and realize someone's benefiting from us being at each other's throat around something that's not even true, we will always have this discord. The other thing that has to happen is for us to recognize that asking each other, what does support look like? It's really on an individual basis. It's not the same for everyone, but we have to have this symbiotic relationship of support. What does support look like for you? Support for me looks very different from a girlfriend of mine who is like, Deetra, you can have a, I don't want to run anything. I want to be a stay at home mom to these kids. And so what I want the support to do is I don't want to have to pay anything. I don't have to worry about anything. She is, we call her a pampered princess because when she travels, all she knows is someone shows up and picks her up. 
right? That she doesn't know how it happens. She just knows that magically someone appears. So I think we have to be willing to say, what does my partner need? But overall, for Black women in general, we need to know that we are supported, that we are loved, and that it's not a competition, it's a collaboration. We want to know that we are not seen, our success is not seen as a threat to a man's masculinity. We want to know that we are seen as truly when someone says, hey, queen, I want to know that you see me as a queen, but also that you know that I see you as a king. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's important. I, I'm the last person to give marital advice, but I, I, I believe that <laughs> that's the ultimate goal. So, yeah. But me- also, I think... Uh, really quickly before we go, I, I, I think we have to, especially as a people, we have to back it up and don't see support j- just as partnership, right? When I'm in a corporate environment, I'm looking at my brother and saying, look, how how can I hold you down? There is nothing romantic here, but we are in this together. So how how can I support you outside of this whole romantic environment? But in this environment, how can how can we collaborate so that we both win here so that there's a a collective win for everyone? And so support for me, for our black women, and our black men is not just about romantic relationships is how do we support each other in this political environment? How do we support each other in this corporate environment? How do we make sure that when I look to my shoulder and I see a, a skin folk that they really are kin folk and that we're going to, I can, I can go about my day, not even worried about if they have my back or not. I know it's automatic. Yeah. All right. So normally how I end the interview is that I I get to what I call my favorite part and have the guests plug what they do. So, but I'm going to do you a little different. We're going to do the plug now. And then I got one more thing that I want you to do. So go ahead, tell people how they can get hold to this phenomenal, dynamic, high end fashion speaker uh, to, to, to be their coach or to come and speak at, at, at their events. So I tell people you can reach me on several platforms. You can reach me on Instagram at Deetra underscore Giles. That is D-E-T-H-R-A underscore G-I-L-E-S. But you can also find me on LinkedIn. I say all of my employeepreneurs. And if you are following me, you know what an employeepreneur is. You can find me on LinkedIn and there I'm just Deetra Giles. And then I also have a podcast, the Happily Ever Employee Podcast, everywhere you get your podcast. But ultimately, if you truly, truly, truly are serious, you're really serious about booking me, you can hit me at Detra at executprep.com. That's D-E-T-H-R-A at at E-X-E-C-U-P-R-E-P.com. Yeah. And so one of the main reasons why I wanted you on and the timing couldn't be greater as far as the, the be sandwiched between Juneteenth and July the 4th, uh, you are an inspirational speaker and you are on high demand. So I guess to give a a taste of that, my question is what inspiration would you give the nation to get through the remaining months of 2024? Um, I love that question. And one, because I often tell people, I'm not an inspirational or motivational speaker. I'm a transformation speaker. And what I mean by that is when people bring me in, they never book me as a motivational speaker. They book me as a person that's an expert on a business topic, whether it's conflict management, whether it's performance optimization, whether it's improving strategies for their organizations to improve their performance, profits, or productivity, Whatever it is, they're booking me because what I'm doing is going to give them tools to improve the bottom line of their company. That's what they know me for, right? Performance optimization and getting to a a better bottom line. And the reason I make that clarification is because, because I do, and I know what I know, and I do it in the way that I'm gifted to present it, people are inspired. And so people will say, oh my gosh, I felt so motivated and I'm motivated to do X. 
I'm now, I, I have what I need. You gave me the tools to go back and make the change. But in your delivery, you motivated me to implement those tools. And the reason I think that's important is because if you're going to get through the craziness that's around you, you have to, one, know your stuff. Go out and get educated and ask yourself, what value do I add to people, companies, whatever it is? What's the value I add and what is that worth? And then on top of that, how do I deliver the message about that value in a way that makes people want to take what I said and actually do it? Take what I said and actually do it. Because here's the thing. Everyone wants a value add and they want someone that can make them feel like they should do it. So go out and be that person. Be the person that is the best in the world at what you do and be so good at it that it's undeniable. That takes time, practice, and investment in you. But there is no better investment than the investment you will make in yourself. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. Um, you know, you are uh, an incredible person as far as not just what you do, but how you present yourself. And, you know, I, I'm really honored that you took the time to p come on the podcast. I'm, I'm honored that we're connected. And uh, anytime you want to come back on, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, I, 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 every guest has an open invitation, uh, but I definitely wanted to extend that to you because you bring something to the table that is constructive, uplifting, and is direly needed in this time. So, uh, Deidre Giles, I, I salute you, and I thank you again for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right, guys, and we'll catch y'all on the other side. Hello, this is Eric Fleming, host of A Moment with Eric Fleming, and I need your help. We have an opportunity to cover the Democratic National Convention in Chicago this August, but I need to raise some money. So I need you to go to GoFundMe.com slash help a moment with Eric Fleming broadcast from DNC 2024. That's GoFundMe.com help a moment with Eric Fleming broadcast from DNC 2024. Thank you so much. All right, and we are back. So, I want to go into an event that I went to that uh, has kind of has kind of become a thing in the black community during this election cycle. And I want to give my take on that event. But before I do that, let me thank uh, Dietra Giles for coming on. Um, if you have never heard of her before, uh, she is amazing. If you, I, I, I suggest that y'all Google her, that you YouTube her uh, to understand why I wanted this sister on. Again, it's a political podcast, but we also celebrate black excellence. And black excellence is tied into American politics. If it wasn't for black excellence, I don't know where we would be as a country. I sure wouldn't be having a podcast <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, you know, and, and if I did, it'd be so underground, it, it'd be ridiculous, right? But, um, so I'm really, I really was honored that once she even accepted to come on and, uh, 
that she was willing to share uh, her thoughts and and how there's an intersection intersectionality with politics and the work that she does because it's about leadership development. It's about building people up so they can achieve at their best level, right? So I want to thank her for that. But I I want to tie in what I just said with what I experienced at this event. And the event is called Congress, Cognac, and Cigars. So there's a Republican congressman. And you made me... So I don't know if you remember when I did the podcast about how I was proud that there were uh, black men involved in that whole speakers thing that, you know, King Jeffries was nominated, Byron Donalds was nominated, and uh, it was a black man, um, I want to say John Jones or John James, and, and forgive me, Congressman, for mispronouncing your name because I'm trying to do it off the top of my head without notes. Uh, he's from Michigan who introduced Kevin McCarthy or nominated Kevin McCarthy, and then you had a black woman running the proceedings as the clerk of the House. And how that was a proud moment for me. And I also mentioned the fact that there were, along with the Congressman from Michigan, uh, there was two other congressmen that was in that congressman's class at West Point. It was a white gentleman who is a Democrat and the uh, congressman of Michigan and this gentleman, Wesley Hunt, or two black gentlemen, they're, they're now Republicans, which I found that that was kind of ironic and interesting. But it's, it's Congressman Hunt who came up with this concept about Congress, cognac, and cigars, right? So the, the purpose is, is to go into cities in swing states. Uh, their first one was in Pennsylvania. You may have heard of that because that's where Byron Donald's was trying to make the argument that policy-wise, black folks were better off as as a family, it was able to maintain a family even during the turbulent times of Jim Crow, right? And he was trying to, and you heard my explanation, he was trying to say that because of great society policies of Lyndon Johnson and others that the black family uh, deteriorated and the conservative viewpoint was better for black families, right? And But it didn't come across that way. <laughs> so that was the first event in Philadelphia at a cigar shop. So the whole concept is, is that they go into these cities and these swing states. So Pennsylvania is a swing state. Georgia is a swing state. And they go into, and then they're going to go to Milwaukee for the convention. Excuse me. And, uh, you know, and Wisconsin is a swing state. So the concept is to go to a cigar shop and uh cigar lounge and, and invite people primarily members of the black community to come and listen to the conservative viewpoint and try to convince people to vote for Donald Trump as president and support Republican candidates for Congress and U S Senate. If those States are having those kind of races, Georgia does not have a Senate race uh, this time. (laughs) <laughs> it seemed like we was having a Senate race every year, but uh, or every cycle, but not this time. But Pennsylvania does, and uh, 
so their whole purpose is to try to reach out. And one of the things that Congressman Hunt said was that it was a mistake for the Republican Party not to aggressively go after black vote. I totally agree with that. If you are going to be an American political party, doesn't matter if you're the Democratic Party, doesn't matter if you're Republican, but doesn't matter if you're the Green or the Libertarian Party. If you want to win the election, if you want to have control of Congress, you've got to reach out to black voters. You have to reach out to Latino or Hispanic voters. You have to reach out to Asian American Pacific Islander voters, as well as rural and urban white voters. You have to reach out to everybody. Howard Dean will always be my favorite national chairman of the Democratic Party because he deliberately stated, we are going to have a 50 state strategy. He physically spoke in all 50 states. He actively made sure that the party apparatus was functional in all 50 states during his tenure. And as a candidate for a federal office, I, it was like when he was in town, we had to have a sit down meeting to assess where the campaign was, what was needed and what was realistic. Right. So, um, I applaud the congressman from Texas for having the gumption to push his party to try to have the conversation, right? And then Byron Donalds is kind of like the black Republican. There's only four of them, by the way. There's a possibility for a fifth in Connecticut. but There's only four right now. Um, and the fourth one is, uh, I think, Burgess Owens, who is a former uh, NFL player who got elected to Congress. And he's kind of, by his biological age and his tenure in Congress, he's kind of like the dean of those four. He's been there the longest. And we've had black Republicans throughout history. Uh, uh, Gary Franks comes to mind, J.C. Watts, uh, Edward Brooke in the uh, uh, Senate from Massachusetts. Um, you know, in my lifetime. So, uh, and Tim Scott. So, you know, We've always had, and historically before the big shift, uh, the Republicans, a lot of the Republicans, especially from the southern states, were black men. Uh, Especially during Reconstruction. So there's always been black Republicans in Congress, but as of right now, there's only four in the House. And then you have Tim Scott in the Senate. So, you know, Donalds and Hart, um, I mean, Hunt, I'm sorry, uh, felt that they were the type of people to, to be able to relate to black people and pull this off. Now, I don't know who was the moderator in Philadelphia, but the moderator here in Atlanta was Sage Steele. Uh, and Sage Steele uh, was a anchor on ESPN for a long time. And uh, over the last few years, uh, she's run into, I would say, controversy because she has taken a position on certain issues that a lot of black folks didn't feel comfortable with. And uh, so she's no longer with ESPN. 
and I don't know what she's going to do next. Uh, I think she has a podcast and, uh, you know, so they, they did a podcast prior to, um, the, uh, event and then started, you know, having the dialogue and, and first of all, the, the facility that they had it in, uh, studio cigar lounge is a, a beautiful facility. If you are a cigar aficionado, and you're on the south side of the, of the Atlanta metro area, uh, I would check that out. It's like two stories, really, really nice, really, you know, fits the mode of a uh, nice cigar shop. And, uh, yeah, and I'm a cigar aficionado, so, you know, it is what it is. Nonetheless, uh, it was a good venue and it was packed. Um, you know, at the very you know beginning of it, um, standing room only, but it's not like, you know, it's not like a stadium or anything. <laughs> it's a cigar lounge. So it's not going to take a whole lot of people to pack it, but it was packed. And then the, the thing that I was really, really cool with, cause you know, I felt kind of like, I don't know if y'all remember this movie, in the book, the spook who sat by the door, right? Uh, how, you know, this black man had infiltrated, uh, or, 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 or even better, more modern reference, Judah and the black Messiah, right? Judas and the black Messiah, I should say. Uh, how, you know, as a black man, you know, fitting, trying to fit in in a situation that, you know, that's not really their thing. So I was relieved when I got there that a good number of the people, I would say it was 60, 40 Democrat. You could say 50, 50, but it was, it was a lot more Democrats in the room than it was Republicans based on some of the side conversations I was picking up on. I didn't really talk to anybody. I just was ear hustling, uh, especially standing by the bar. Just a lot of the side conversation, all that. But, you know, the fact these were two black congressmen coming to a place where a lot of these folks hang out, you know, it was an honor. So out of respect, a lot of them came and did their normal hanging out at, at the cigar lounge without, um, you know, and, and got a perk. And that, and that was kind of a thing, you know, in Mississippi, it was like, there was a spot called Habana smoke shop that we used to hang out at back in the day. And, you know, Haley Barber came through and, you know, cognac and cigar, same thing. Uh, and he was, was talking to people and he used me as a prop. He was like, trying to get along with folks like Representative Fleming over here. You know what I'm saying? It was kind of one of those things. Uh, but that was an outreach thing. So that's a thing where you're reaching people who uh, are active voters who have a certain amount of wealth in the black community and, uh, you know, our intelligent people. So again, this is a good place to try to do persuasion, but it was majority Democrats in the room. And as the congressmen were telling their stories, about why they were Republicans, the audience was very, very respectful. And, uh, you know, listen to what they had to say, why they are in the positions they're in. And, and the unique thing about both of them is that they're, they represent majority white districts. And they both lost the first time they ran for Congress. 
So in in one ways, in one way you can say it's a testament that these black men were able to uh crack the code and get in because I I knew a lot of black Republican friends in Mississippi who ran for office who I felt uh, were more qualified than their primary opponent. But because they were black, they didn't get in. And, you know, you can say what you want about that, but it is what it is. So considering the dynamics of the Republican Party today for two black men to represent majority white districts. Uh, you have to respect that. And as somebody that has gone through an elective process, who's run for federal office, um, yeah, you have to respect that. So, Having said all that, when it came down to talking about the issues, that's when it got lit. (laughs) That's when the crowd, you, that's when you noticed who was on what side of the aisle (laughs) when, when the issues started coming up. Uh, You know, the, the, the main thing they wanted to stress was education uh, inflation and immigration. Those are three things they're trying to push. Those are the three things that they feel that they can swing black. Those three issues are the things that they can swing black voters on. Uh, and the immigration one got really, really heated to the point where the law enforcement that was there had to kind of act like a referee because you had some black folks who were very passionate about the number of immigrants coming in, the perception that the border is wide open, uh, that Democrats don't care about wide open borders. Uh, You heard that. But then you heard a lot of black people saying, what are you talking about? It's like most of us, including, you know, one of the congressmen, you know, are descendants of immigrants from either Africa or the Caribbean islands, right? And so, you know, I heard one guy say, you know, I'm Dominican, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm not feeling what he's saying, you know? Um, so it was very it was very passionate about that issue, even more so than education or inflation. And that was the gist of the challenge. And, and you know, uh, one of the people asked, well, why didn't you support what President Biden offered? Which Congressman McDonald's responded, well, our, our plan was better, which was not exactly truthful because whatever the Republicans had in their plan was in the bill that Biden was signing off on. Right. There was some compromises made on the conservative side, but not many. It was pretty much their bill. And, uh, you know, I mean, somebody even challenged the fact that it's like, you know, Donald Trump killed that bill. And uh, the the congressman artfully dodged <laughs> that comment, but you know it was it was really really comforting to see, and it, it and I'll get into the other issue that really kind of really got the crowd going, uh, but it was comforting to see these black men deal with black people um, in an environment that was not friendly to them. 
it was a comfortable environment. But once we, you know, once people started getting into the issues, uh, it was not a friendly environment. So the the other issue that really stoked, because one 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 um, audience member asked the question, "Why did you two support?" reinstating or keeping a monument to Confederates or to a Confederate soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, And Wesley Hunt, if you don't know his background, he was a military guy. Served his country in combat, went on 55 combat missions. He told the story about his experience at West Point and the fact that during his time there, he had to, had to stay at the Robert E. Lee barracks. Robert E. Lee is a graduate of West Point, And even though he was a Confederate general, he was considered one of the great, he still considered, one of the great American military strategists or whatever. I, I can't say hero, but you know, he was one of the great American generals in, in a lot of military scholars and historians eyes. Um, so there's a barracks at West point named after him. And Congressman Hunt said that if he had not stayed in that barracks, he would be a different, he wouldn't be the person he is today. To which somebody in the audience replied, yeah, you would be better. Right. So I'm telling you the vibe was not, you know, I think, you know, it was depicted in Philadelphia as it was a black Republican love fest. It was not that in Atlanta, Georgia. It was not a black Republican love fest. There were people that the chairman of the Republican party even showed up for this event. Of course, if you've got Republican congressmen coming to your town, you, you're going to be there. Uh, but you know, he was there and, uh, and, and there were, you know, a lot of the people, uh, that were seated, uh, you know, were either pro-Trump or pro-Republican folks. But, uh, (laughs) yeah, it was, it was not a friendly crowd. It was, it was, it was a road game. (laughs) You use sports vernacular. It was not a home game. It was a road game. So, the the other issue that came up that really was contentious was reparations. This uh, elderly gentleman who had also served in the military wanted to know their position on reparations. And so Donald, whose background is in finance and, you know, being a financial advisor and all that stuff, uh, basically made the argument that it's it's not feasible. He he highlighted the fact about all the years of slavery and then all the years of Jim Crow. And he was basically making the argument that you know too much time has passed to make it feasible. But that's a mindset of writing a check. And so that's why he's opposed to it. But it's not necessarily writing a check for reparation. The issue in America And like I said, I didn't ask a question. I just was there to observe. 
But I did go to another event prior to this event I'm talking about in which the authors of a book called 15 Cents on the Dollar, uh, Louise Story and Ebony Reed, who I believe both were journalists at one point, uh, co-wrote a book and, and it was basically a research book on the wealth gap between African Americans and white Americans in the United States. And the 15 cents on the dollar means for every dollar that a white person has, a black person has 15 cents of wealth, right? The issue is the wealth gap. How do we fix that? That is the ultimate reparation. And at the pace we are going, according to the sister story and read, the best case scenario is that at the pace we are going, we will receive, re, uh, uh, achieve parity in 91 years. That's the best case scenario. At the current rate we are at, that's the best case scenario of narrowing the gap. We will achieve that in 91 years. So to me, if we are going to have a serious discussion about reparations, it's not about the Dave Chappelle skit. It's not about uh, any other discussions about just writing a check to appease black people or any other form of reparations like with the Japanese Americans and, and others. It's about repairing the damage and the biggest damage that slavery and Jim Crow did was deny black people the opportunity to attain wealth. And they basically said that they were against the student uh, loan forgiveness. Saying, and the argument was, again, this was Donald's, saying that two-thirds of America didn't even go to college. So should those two-thirds pay for the people who did attend college? <laughs> you know, well, there's a substantial amount of Americans who don't like us going to war. But our taxes go to the Department of Defense. Um, there's some Democrats who, you know, or voters don't like you know, Democrats don't like Republicans, Republicans don't like Democrats, but if you put in, if you sign that box to say that $3 goes toward uh, that presidential campaign fund to allow people to get public money to finance their campaign for president of the United States. Um, money's going to go to the other person. If the Democrat is making, raising all his money and the Republicans not, that Republican can tap into that money. I'm not voting for the Republican, but I paid the taxes and I check off the box. Because I think public financing would kind of eliminate a lot of the stuff that's going on in politics now, right? But that's a whole other discussion for another day. Nonetheless, when Mr. Donald said what he said and then Congressman Hunt followed up on that and uh, doubled down on that, um. That was not received very well. <laughs> you know, 
And, you know, nobody called them names. Nobody was disrespectful in that regard. Nobody was using the term Uncle Tom or sellout. If anybody was using it, it was those two gentlemen describing some of the stuff and the vitriol they've gotten for their positions. Even Sage still, you know, was really, really emotionally, uh, even though she was the moderator, she shared the fact that she's even gotten death threats for some of the positions she took as anchor ESPN, uh, which should never be the case, regardless of which side are you on. It's like you can passionately, passionately disagree with people, but it's like, yeah, we, we, you know, I hope you die. Uh, I hope your kids get raped. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's not part of the conversation we need to be having. It doesn't matter if it's Trump supporters or Biden supporters. It doesn't matter, you know, how you feel on either side of the Israel-Hamas conflict, how you feel about anything. That That's not acceptable, right? But let's just say that the black men and women in that room, uh, the majority of them were not happy hearing two black congressmen say that they're not for reparations in any way, shape, or form. There was good debate about the immigration thing to a degree. And you kind of got a sense of where they are and and the system is is broken but it's broken more because of bureaucracy and political rhetoric than it is about bodies and the real culprits who republicans will never address is big business when Ron DeSantis decided to go after (sighs) immigrants the way that he did, the biggest people who were complaining to him about his stance was big business, especially those in the construction industry, especially those in the agriculture industry. They were very, very upset. And they tried to bypass him by getting in legislators' faces. Right? So it was it was an amazing experience in the sense that I commend those two gentlemen for doing what they were doing on behalf of their party. But I was really impressed with especially the black men that were in that room and how they also appreciated the fact that these men showed up, but they let them know what was really on their mind and let them know that, yeah, just because you're here, we're not be, we're not going to be silently polite. They got a sense of how, black people really feel about reparations, how they really feel about immigration, how they really feel about uh, inflation, economics. And they didn't really dabble in that too much other than trying to, you know, and, you know, they talked about the debt and all that stuff. And the reality is, is that based on what happened over the last four years with Donald Trump, the debt is, out of whack it shouldn't be that high but because you wanted to placate folks that could contribute the most and kind of disregard everybody else that's working for a living um you put the debt high and then covid didn't help 
right? As you know, you've heard some guests come on talk about that government spending contributes to inflation. But it was necessary spending. It was dealing with an immediate crisis, both during Trump's administration and the early part of Biden's administration. And debt forgiveness, you know, kicks in there too. However, the biggest people that really are complaining about the debt forgiveness is not the guy who didn't go to college. He's being told to complain about it. It's the banks. <laughs> it's the folks who made the loans. Those are the folks that are upset. That's the, They're losing the money, especially the interest. They're losing the money. So, yeah. Um, but I was really, really impressed with the way that folks took their information, took their pitch, and challenged them on issues. And that that was refreshing to me. Because, but also it brings up another point real quick. That, you know, the whole focus of the media has always been over these last 10 to 20 years about white men being angry. Black folks are angry too. (laughs) Black folks are not happy. And those gentlemen saw that. But it wasn't a way that they could manipulate it. It wasn't a way that they could persuade. It was something they had to digest. It was something they had to take in and they they had to give a report. It's like, yeah, George is going to be a problem. (laughs) These black men, these black women in Georgia are not, they're not drinking the Kool-Aid. And to be honest, that may have been what happened in Philadelphia. The whole focus came off one quote that Byron Donald said, but it wasn't the vibe. If the vibe was the same in Philadelphia as it was in Atlanta, yeah. Good luck on getting that 26, 30% of the black vote you say that you're going to get. That's not happening. Uh you know, Donald Trump did get 20% of the vote. Last time he ran, I don't think he's getting anything higher. I think he's getting less. And a good barometer of that was what I saw at the Congress Cognac and Cigars Forum here in Atlanta. So I just wanted to give a report on that. I I think if you're a Democrat, if you're a member of the Democratic Party, it's not time for despair. It's not time to be overconfident, but it's not time for despair. Joe Biden can get reelected. The House can shift where King Jeffries can become the speaker. The Senate can be maintained. Uh, Maybe even gain a seat. That might be pushing it, but if they gain a seat, then uh, Madam Vice President doesn't have to set a record in breaking ties. Uh, as she did this term. So it's a very, very competitive race. Do not get it twisted. It should not be competitive based on who the Republicans are offering as their nominee, but it is. And it's very, very important that we as black people show up and show out. 
Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Um, the uh, GoFundMe campaign is still going. Uh, I need y'all's help. Uh, the number is getting smaller, but not quick enough. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate those who have donated already. I appreciate those who are thinking about it. Uh, those who are trying to assist in getting the word out. Uh, but, um, we've got a hard deadline. Uh, January, July 15th, uh, got to get certain things in, uh, secure reservations and all that. Um, trying to get the cheapest airfare possible. Uh, so, uh, go to www.momenteric.com and uh, click on the link and make that donation. And the insight that I'm giving you from what I witnessed at the uh, Congress Cognac and Cigars event is kind of the summaries that I'm going to give about the convention. Uh, we're going to put that on Patreon for free, uh, the daily stuff, and there'll be some interviews. Uh, the big interviews will be on the podcast, um, the regular podcast after the convention. So again, it all depends on who I've been, who I will get access to. I've put in a request for people, and uh, but I got to get there. So I need y'all to. Uh, go to www.momenteric.com uh, or you can just go to GoFundMe and put in uh, Eric Fleming or a moment with Eric Fleming and it should come right up. And uh, whatever you can give, I'll greatly appreciate. And you'll appreciate it too from the coverage that we'll give you at the convention. So with that, until next time. Thank you.